Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Sustaining Sustainability. I'm your host, C.B. Bhattacharya, Professor and Director of the Center for Sustainable Business at the University of Pittsburgh. This week, I'm excited to be joined by Rebecca Marmot, Chief Sustainability Officer at Unilever, based out of London, UK. Unilever is one of the world's largest and oldest consumer goods businesses. Present in 190 countries, Unilever's products reach 2.5 billion people in the world every day. We've invited Rebecca to join us this week to discuss the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the company's sustainability strategy called the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, as well as important topics within that strategy like diversity of workforce, taking plastics out of the supply chain, and reducing fossil fuel usage. Rebecca, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's a real pleasure to get to chat to you. How, if at all, has COVID impacted Unilever's commitment to environmental and social sustainability? So the first priority for us was making sure that we had the right kind of systems and protocols in place to look after the real heroes who are keeping our business afloat. Of course, the real heroes at Unilever are the teams who are working in the factories, in manufacturing, in our supply chain and, and the sales teams who are going out and about meeting with customers. And then after that, we split our, our company and our approach up into four other areas. So people, number one, and then we also had separate work streams looking at supply, demand, finance and communities, which is the area that I look after. We donated 100 million euros worth of product that was really helpful and needed by organizations around the world like UNICEF, UNHCR, WHO, etc. And then in partnership with the UK government's FCDO, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, we co-launched a, a platform called the Hygiene and Behaviour Change Coalition, where we've pledged to try and help together a billion people investing in social and public health initiatives. So what Unilever is bringing is our understanding and expertise in behaviour change, so really helping together with over 20 different partner organisations around the world um, to try and, and bring to life and bring to communities good everyday behaviour change techniques around practising good hygiene, social distancing, wearing a mask, et cetera. And I think that kind of approach that we've taken very much reflects what, what we call at Unilever a multi-stakeholder model, where sustainability really sits at the heart of what we're doing. So it's not for us about an add-on or, or a plan um, that is distinct from the business, but actually just doing business in a different way. So I'd say from a sustainability perspective, COVID has really just reinforced to us and strengthened our commitment to try and solve these kind of global problems. I mean, we all know there's so many different multiple crises at the moment piling up. Of course, there's the health crisis that, that you and I have been chatting about just now, CB. There's the ecological crisis, huge, huge inequality issue at the moment. Unemployment and a global recession means that that's only going to, unfortunately, um, I think probably crease and, 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 and get even worse. And of course, racial inequity, which we just cannot let go of the immense momentum that I think has, has been galvanized to address what are fundamental systemic inequalities. So on, on, on climate and nature, we made some new targets around net zero on all of our products from cradle to shelf by, by 2039, de deforestation free supply chains by 2023, a whole new regenerative agriculture code to work with our suppliers. And I think probably most excitingly, a billion euro climate and nature fund that we're going to use to enable all of our brands, brands like Seventh Generation, Ben & Jerry's, Dove, to be able to take action on really making tangible change and progress behind these kinds of things. But diversity is an important topic of discussion today in both professional and academic circles. We have the pressing cause of the inclusion of women in leadership positions, and uh, Unilever has reported some significant progress uh, in that area. Can you talk about the journey the company took to promote gender balance and achieve 51% uh, of women in management positions? This is a journey that started a long time ago in, in, in Unilever, but I think when we 
started on the most current phrase back in 2010. At that point, I think women made up about just over a third, I, I think it was 38% of managerial roles. And since then, we've introduced a whole raft of different policies and partnership programs really designed to try and support women within the company and break down of the, bar- you know, the barriers that exist around recruitment, around retention, around ongoing development. So I feel that we have made good progress now um, up to 51%. You know, I think part of that is about leading from the top. Um, Alan has a global diversity board, um, which is accountable for, for reporting on our, our, on our diversity and inclusion strategy and driving gender balance within the business. And then across the business, there's about 100 diversity and inclusion champions who actually bring that to life on the ground day to day. Um, but I think, you know, aside from that and aside from setting targets, which of course is important, I think the big unlock for me is about how we've really tried to improve the culture. So I think, you know, there's that prevailing opinion that, that exists. That if you if you change the culture, only then do you really start to actually see the numbers taking a you know, a move in the right direction for, for the long term. And I think, you know, while, while being able to do that, you, you actually can impact for the long term, not just Unilever, but 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 other other companies as well, actually thinking in a more holistic way about how do we provide better support for parents. So actually it's around thinking about men and women and 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 gender neutral, but not just targeting women alone. So for example, in 2018, we rolled out a new global maternal well-being standard and parental standards, which guarantee employees 16 weeks paid maternity leave around the world. Um, also given many different countries now three months off um, for paternity leave as well. In the UK, I'm very lucky. I work in, in an environment where we have a very generous um, maternity and paternity package. It's what the, the UK government has, has put into place. But I think the shift towards flexible working and encouraging employees to be able to take ownership is hugely important. I think then looking from a cultural perspective again, Actually, at traditionally, what might have been more male-dominated functions, for example, things like supply chain, really making sure that we go out with a very targeted recruitment and mentoring program to help build a strong pipeline of female talent. But what I, what I would say is all, all of those initiatives um, which deal with trying to tackle that problem in Unilever, I feel have really been helped by what we've tried to do actually outside of the business. So you know, one thing which I'm really excited by and, and something that probably for me has been one of the best examples of, of trying to influence systemic change it's a couple of years ago in fact gosh four years ago now it's 2016 i think we launched a new program um called unstereotype together with un women and, and a host of other actually private sector companies who we invited to be part of it what we wanted to do was to actually change the way that gender um and different types of, 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 uh, of people are represented in advertising. Um, and I think if you think back to how much, you know, all of us, when we're growing up or different points in our life, you can pinpoint adverts that really reflect society at the time. And by changing the way that we portray gender in advertising, really, which sound like very simple things, but changing, for example, the way that we put women into leadership positions, showing a man doing domestic chores in the house. Perhaps it's showing a man taking the lead on childcare and the woman being out in a more traditional corporate environment. Really just doing small things like that can hugely impact the way that society views gender. And I think doing those kind of things are, are, are really, really important. And again, we then looked at actually what does or how do those kind of stereotypes impact people within the business So we commissioned a study last year to understand how stereotypes affected about 8,000 employees. And the results were quite tough reading. I think 60% of women and 49% of men said they felt that stereotypes at some stage in their career within the company or outside it had held them back. Um, So now we've also done a lot of work around unstereotyping within the workplace, um, really trying to shatter, I think, what are, you know, very very limited, limiting norms, which some of us might not even realize that we hold within ourselves. According to the GlobeScan Sustainability Leader Survey, Unilever was ranked number one in sustainability leadership for the 10th year in a row. I mean, that's, that's so impressive. And part of that success, of course, is related to the development of the 10-year 
Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. Can you explain to our viewers why the company chose this approach, this 10-year approach to the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan and how the plan helps the company achieve its social and environmental targets? I think when I when I go back to 2010, it was a very um, pivotal moment, I think, not just for Unilever, but actually globally, you know, the, the crash, the financial crash had happened at the time uh, Paul Pullman uh, was just coming into Unilever. And I think there was this recognition among many different businesses, actually, and, and, and different stakeholders around the world that you know, we, the world globally, needed to change the way that, that this quite entrenched form of, of capitalism and business um, had and the view of success. And I think you know, a lot of that was focused very much on short term shareholder, financial shareholder returns. And I think there was a realization that if we wanted to fundamentally try and change the way that business is operating and be more equitable and make progress and grow in a way that actually was sustainable rather than growing just purely for you know, a few elite and at the expense of the rest of the world and of the planet, actually, we had to try and approach doing business in a different way. So putting sustainability front and center was, was really a response to that. And from that came the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. So what we did with the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan was really set out some very, I think at the time, hugely ambitious targets around changing social, environmental and, and, and economic performance right across the value chain. So the, when we first started off, we had these three big macro goals, one around improving the health and well-being of a billion people, one around halving environmental impact, and one around livelihoods and improving livelihoods right the way across our value chain. And, and if you think about Unilever, you know, that means really starting with the sourcing of the crops and the commodities and working with the farmers in the field all the way through the life cycle into the manufacturing process out into the market, through the marketing the, of the brands themselves, looking at what we can do in terms of wider systemic change in society and actually trying to shift from what was really traditionally a very linear approach to consumer goods into a circular economy. So, so, <laughs> so we were trying to do quite a lot. Um, and underneath those three big targets, we had a whole host of different metrics that we put in place that were um, time bound, very, very specific. We realized that uh, at Unilever went through a, the very same rigorous reporting and assurance process um, with our auditors, as you would expect in other aspects of the business, because it was important to us to bring that structure and rigor to what we were trying to do. So I think as we as we progress through that plan, and you know, we're coming to an end of it now in, in, in 2020. We've, we've learned an awful lot. I think we've learned about how to do that successfully and also some lessons actually uh, on, on how to do things differently as we move forward, really thinking about the power of partnerships, really thinking about how we can influence systemic change beyond working with our own business. I think a lot of lessons around the essential um, focus on showing a, a clear business case for doing this. You know, this wasn't about CSR. This was about doing business in a different way, showing how it could grow our brand sustainably, showing how it helped us to really build trust. And that's been hugely, hugely important for us, both for our employees now, but, but as a retention, uh, as a retention tool, I should say, but also to attract new employees. I mean, we know the main reason that people come to work at Unilever and we're the top graduate recruiter in over 50 countries is because of sustainability and wanting to work somewhere that reflects the values that they feel are important. And of course, it helps to reduce risk. You know, sustainable sourcing is a really, really important way for us to be able to change the way that we do the sourcing of really important crops and commodities for Unilever. But of course, by doing that, not only are you helping the livelihoods of the people that we're working with, and of course, having a positive environmental impact, but also from a business perspective, it's brilliant for us to be able to secure supply of those really essential uh, 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 commodities for us. Um, and it saves money. Rebecca, one thing about this Unilever Sustainable Living Plan that I found intriguing enough was this idea of small actions, big difference. And uh, I liked it enough to actually call, gave it the title of my book. 
Can you explain what that means to you? What does small actions, big difference, what does this philosophy mean to you? When you think about the scale of, of Unilever, a third of the world are, are using Unilever products every day, which you know, is a huge opportunity for us, but it, it's also a huge responsibility. I think sometimes you can feel, and I certainly feel, you know, extremely insignificant and really what 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 difference can I make actually you know what what how how can I possibly influence any of these huge macro big things that are happening in the world and actually I can and you can and we all can um, and I think the point about small actions big difference is if all of us just take a couple and make a couple of changes in our lives actually that really adds up and it's through that collective approach that you really start to see actually the positive impact and the positive scale of changes that can happen. I think you know, we, we saw it with we saw it recently with COVID during the lockdown, which was awful, you know, and certainly not a situation that we any of us want to go back to. But I think we saw the dramatic increase and improvement in the environment around us and cleaner skies and cleaner seas and massive drop in pollution. And I think, you know, in a realistic way, actually, we can all make small changes. So it might be about eating more fruit and vegetables, trying not to over rely on the same the same food types each day, thinking about how if I diversify my diet, it's good and healthy for me, but actually it puts less stress on the earth as well. Or it might be if I really just make an effort to wash my hands five times a day at those key points, which is something that we really try to reinforce with, with Lifebuoy, with Unilever's largest soap brand, actually I'm protecting myself from potentially picking up COVID, but I'm also you know, washing my hands and keeping clean and helping those around me. So I think it's really that sense of not feeling that each individual can't make a difference. We can. Um, and actually, if everybody starts to think that way, then actually what you see is really positive impact. We are chatting with Rebecca Marmot, the Chief Sustainability Officer of Unilever. And even though we don't do this very often, the conversation has been so interesting that we are going to break this up into two parts and we will stop here for today and bring Rebecca back for our next episode where we will talk about what the next phase of the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan is going to look like and how they are affecting systemic change going forward. This is your host, C.B. Paracharya, saying goodbye and please join us for the next edition of Sustaining Sustainability. And before I sign off, I do want to say that this podcast is made possible by the help of my colleagues, Leslie Marshall, who is the Associate Director of the Center for Sustainable Business, and Alyssa Martinek, who is the Sustainability Coordinator of the Center for Sustainable Business. I'm your host, C.B. Paracharya. Bye-bye. <music>